lockdown, I think, for all of us, you know, whether in the museums or elsewhere, has been a period of time where our usual experience of being near to each other, to things, to the places we're used to going, you know, to the, uh, the cafes or the restaurants or whatever, has been lost, has been removed. So, and, and, in a, and in a lot of ways, that sort of disruption to proximity has something, I think, to say about how museums operate all the time. So the experience for me, at least, of, you know, lockdown has, has been on the one side a, a temporal experience. It's been one where some things seem to take forever. Things take a long time. You know, whereas other things seem to happen actually, you know, faster. Time is moving, you know, faster, as we see with the vaccine that Oxford has, of course, announced uh, today, which, which is absolutely wonderful news. Yeah, and so it's a temporal moment, but it's also a visual moment. I mean, here we are, you know, not able to be near each other, but we're looking at each other, you know, all of the time. We're looking at screens, we're looking into each other's, you know, houses often. So it's a visual, yeah, it's a visual moment. So that disruption of, you know, intimacy of, of being sort of near each other, you know, leads to a disruption over time and over visuality. And so I want to say that maybe for a long time, the, you know, removal of being near to things that you care for has also, for African people, for others in the global south, has always been a, an experience which has, 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 has really uh, disrupted how things are seen and how things operate over time. And that's really, you know, the purpose of, you know, this sort of your title of this lecture, that notion of the visuality and its relationship to whiteness, that idea of the temporal and its uh, relationship really, you know, to being you know, near things, as I will say. So the book, you know, when I'm really introducing a, a single idea from a book which has a lot of layers, but let's just you know, say that the book is about the Benin expedition. This is the punitive expedition, you know, from the later part of the 19th century, you know, in which something like 100, uh, I'm sorry, uh, something like uh, 10,000 objects or so you know, were looted, you know, thousands of the bronze objects, but also ivory objects, objects made of wood, coral work, and so forth. And uh, you know, I think over time, at you know, the moment, we're getting a sense of, of actually how that act was a part of a wider pattern of sort of, you know, attacks of the corporate, the militarist attacks, you know, that Africa really you know, suffered over the, you know, the 1890s, you know, you know, sort of, sort of earlier in the 19th century as well. And in the case of the Benin objects, the sheer violence of that attack leading to the, 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 you know, the movement of these objects to, you know, over 150 and more, uh, yeah, if you like, institutions around the world. So these are some of the objects that we're used to seeing, the plaques which were taken, you know, the heads and the ivory the tusks that were carved with the, you know, the history of the royal court, you know, individual objects of ivory and of uh, metalwork, actually removed from, from the, uh, the sacred altars where the, the sort of history of each individual over was it told from 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 the carvings on on an ivory tusk here's a rare photograph from 1891 of one of these uh in advance of that attack but actually also a wider range of sort of you know acts of uh, uh, taking as well so you know what the book does in order to try to understand that history is in in a you know, new way is it introduces some um, some ideas and some uh, new vocabularies that I think that we need in this 
you know, this moment in order to try to really, you know, reframe how we think of the restitution arguments here in uh, Europe, how we listen increasingly, to, you know, to African uh, voices about, you know, wanting objects, to, you know, actually, yeah, returned. So a series of ideas which you can see in the book in include inverting that idea of the life history of objects as if every movement of an object is a positive you know layer that adds to the life history and instead talking about histories of loss histories of if you like your death uh, and so the necrographic which is a play on a sheil and bembe's idea of the necro political that in turn is a reframing of the of the Foucauldian idea of the uh, the biopolitical. So rather than uh, rather than only the uh, the biopolitics, there is the necropolitics of who gets to live and who dies in the context of forced migration in the contemporary world, a fortress Europe, but also you know here for African objects you know, in a lot of ways, these are histories of loss. These are histories of taking. You know, it introduces ideas of how we ought to reframe these punitive expeditions and, and other forms of, you know, taking as, you know, military histories. And so there's a World War Zero that we haven't even started to tell the you know, history of, which are all of these incidents, which we understand at the moment to be isolated you know, expeditions, it almost sounds like it's a fun day out, a Boy Scouts, you know, boy's own thing, an expedition. But in fact, of course, you know, these these were immensely violent and they were large operations with all, all of the modern military might that we were to see in the First World War. You know, electric lighting and the machine gun and the... the uh, a rocket launcher and so forth. So there are ideas also in the book of the chronopolitical, the way in which the museum was sort of put to work as a weapon that after you've, you've murdered everybody and you've actually, you know, removed their objects, you can actually say that the art and the culture of a certain African location is archaeological. You can present Africa as if it's in the past. And so in the case of, of the the expedition in 1897, you know, within weeks, actually, these objects were on display alongside ancient Egypt, alongside Assyrian objects, you know, as if this was a dead culture. You know, there's, there's a number of, of other ideas there, you know, ideas over objects as events, object ideas over, over how we ought to think about a theory of you know, taking. But it's really this, this idea of your know, white projection which i want to introduce in the time i've got here at the moment here today this evening and so really the purpose of this lecture is to help us answer the question why does african cultural restitution matter you know i think at this moment in this year when the long-term struggles of fighting anti-racism have been suddenly more visible in our world, you know, a lot of people will ask, well, absolutely, you know, we need to fight racism and we need to tackle underrepresentation, you know, and we need to talk about, about anti-black violence. But, you know, what on earth is art? You know, how is that involved? Why, you know, why is a museum actually the right place to have this conversation? And so I want to argue through my idea of the white projection that we see in the military expeditions and in the, in the museums now, that in fact the museums offer crucial spaces for fighting racism, but also for understanding the ongoing nature of empire. That, that racism hasn't just emerged from nowhere, that it has a history, and that certain institutions have been built to make that history last, to naturalize inequality. So when we look at the displays as we see here, the sort of your know, traditional ideas of the display of objects on the left-hand side in London at the British Museum of the Benin objects, on the right-hand side here in the institution I work in, the Pitt Rivers, 
we've often in the past seen you know these displays well remember when we focused on the displays and not on the you know the vast majority of objects you know that aren't on display that can't be seen but in focusing on those displays we've done the sort of you know tony bennett style thing of the exhibitionary complex we've done the fugodian thing of this is a prison the visuality of this is about surveillance it's the panopticon we've seen museums as representing others we haven't seen them as dispossessing others we haven't actually addressed what my colleague uh, nick mizof whose work is actually so important to, to this idea of the uh, the white projection we we haven't looked at not we we've, we've sort of criticized you know what's on display without actually addressing nick's idea of what he calls the right to look which he links into the his work on the black lives matter movement so nick's crucial book the appearance of 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 black lives matter and here's a link to you you know you can either uh, download it you can buy a copy as well he uses he uses hannah rent's idea of the space of appearance in order to say from charlottesville onwards that what happened in the black lives matter movement not this year but over the past five years has been that the technologies of seeing and of the, how you document seeing so the dash cam footage and the cell phone footage has made visible anti-black violence that has been happening for centuries suddenly it can be seen and suddenly a new moment happens in the politics of anti-racism and so i want to use that idea from nick to ask why when we think about the benin expedition that we are familiar often you know, certainly a lot of those in the field who are used to talking about these we're familiar with the image you know, on the left hand side the sort of rather monty python style image it's almost funny these 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 you know your white guys in the in the silly hats who you've taken these things there's no sense really of the violence there's no sense really of the loss it's a sort of quirky photograph in the way it's been presented i think it's been immensely problematic as compared with this other image from exactly the same um uh moment it's the same man you know there he is with the city the palace is burning the sheer desecration of a sacred royal landscape the destruction of you know of a site which was over six or seven hundred years old and the destruction of of a kingdom so how can white projection as an idea help us think about how nick's idea of the politics of seeing the right to see what happens if you see something if you make something visible you know the regime of uh, visuality of the museum becoming something else rather than objectification you know we have to start by understanding what and where what sort of ideology projection was so in the british context and one of the very interesting conversations that i'm having with uh, benedict and her team at the moment is how in some ways this ideology i'm presenting is very much a british one it maybe isn't there in the german and the french you know ways of seeing but certainly it's there in the british the idea that the little wars the 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 these these expeditions as they as they happened in the name of your corporate colonialism were framed always as a punishment some small infraction was undertaken some people were killed even just the presence of you know non of non-christian religion of you know traditional forms of enslavement these were seen as actually it's fair game you know we can do whatever we want we can attack with all of the violence that we have so the maxim machine guns and the rocket launchers are then you know, put to work against the bows and arrows and the yeah, muskets and you know tens of thousands of people are killed at the heart of that idea the idea of the, of the punishment which is also the reprisal and of course that for in the history of the british empire it takes us to northern ireland it takes us to kenya in the 1950s 
it's a switching of positions. It's a blaming of the enemy for violent crimes. It's ascribing brutality to the victim. It's a logic that arguably, and the book argues this, it starts with the naval operations right in the earlier 19th century of anti-slavery. So, so the Navy are there to put down, in the name of abolition, slave trading. But very quickly, there's a mission creep that leads to actually, we, you know, we can do what we want because we're fighting these, these other things. And of course, the role of the British in slavery, in turning indigenous slavery, African slavery into, into something industrial, into something totally different is entirely removed. So the projection also works in a Freudian sense. This is a psychological process of the transference of one's own thoughts and actions you know, to somebody else. This is a kind of transposition in Freudian terms. And I'm using Freud, I'm not really using Freud as a contemporary thinker. I'm saying that Freud is almost part of this early 20th century mode of thought, you know, um, you know, where there is a transposition of sort of trauma and violence from the aggressor, you know, to the victim. In English also, projection has these other senses. So a on a map, the projection is the flattening of the map. It's the drawing of a three-dimensional landscape. It's a, it's a sort of simplification. It's a form of control. It's a way of seeing the world in those ways. There's also a sense of the photographic, the source of projection as a magic lantern you know, as a, uh, you know, as a way of, as a form of display. I think in this ideology, there's a temporal sense, the projection, as we've seen, of contemporary objects into the past, hand in hand with the killing, but also a source of projection of the museum into the future. It will always be there, it's permanent, as opposed to the African impermanence. There's a visual logic to this that persists to this uh, uh, day. And this is where the lecture is really going to go in, in the final 10 minutes or so. The way in which that, those projections we see that are part of the, the justification for these acts in the late 19th century, they're, they're re-emerging today. They re-emerge when, when those who protest anti-black violence in America are are said to be looters. So this is depicting even those of us who are calling for restitution. We are depicted as, you know, those who attack our own museums. I mean, I have been told I'm attacking my own institution. This is a conflation of what is uh, good for one party with a, you know, with a good for all, that idea of universalism. So that's one half of this ideology that I'm trying to describe which is there in the act of the taking, the looting, but it's re-emerging today. Here's the other side of that coin, the whiteness which goes hand in hand with this. So in the book, I try to understand the role of race, you know, the myth of race, the ideology of race, as part of that ideology of the projective. So as part of a host a wider host of material uh, approaches ways of trying to naturalize inequality and to make it endure so we're familiar with the idea of the anthropology museum in the context of natural history with having displayed skulls that told the racist lie that there are different types of human they measured the skull they gave these you know, racist stories. And of course, scientists had no problem at all after the Second World War, after fascism was actually defeated, from removing these displays, from saying this is bad science, this is wrong. But somehow we cultural and artistic curators who feel ourselves often to be so much more aware of racism so much more aware of the politics of what we do, we didn't recognize that these displays of cultural objects were doing precisely the same thing. They were displayed in order to show a story, to, 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 to tell a fake narrative of 
white supremacy, of cultural evolution. These objects are here because of a victory, a military victory, which is linked to superiority. It's naturalized, it's made to endure in the physical display. Think of the speed with which looted objects were displayed in ethnological museums after their looting, their chaotic looting in Benin. It was only weeks until on the open market, the curators had acquired these things. So while an earlier generation of anthropologists, let's say 25 years ago, if someone were to be giving this lecture, you know, Jim Clifford or, you know, Marshall Stalins or whoever, the idea would have been that these museums, you know, created the primitive. They created the image of alterity. But we missed something there. We missed the counterpart, which is the production of whiteness, the enaction of whiteness among the curators and the racialization of the visitor as white. You come to the Pitt Rivers Museum, you're on the right side of the glass and then you're, you're on the human side of the glass. You're not objectified and you're invited to join a group which at that time in the 1880s to 1920s, a group which was being created, being made up for the purposes of a new kind of racism. So the production of whiteness happened not only in the idea of the creation of the other, but in its counterpart, the idea of discovery, of encounter, of wonder. These ideas that are re-emerging at Humboldt Forum, re-emerging in the British Ethnographic Museum as well. There's a very specific time frame to this. We're talking between the 1880s and the 1920s, which is why in the book I, I identify white projection as part of a wider anthropological set of ideas that is related to a sort of proto-fascism. This is linked, it ties in exactly time-wise to Cedric Robinson's account of the film, okay, which of course is another sort of a projection, the film The Birth of the Nation, which he calls the re-whitening of America. So we see this indoors in the museum, and maybe most visibly we see this outdoors in the monuments that were built you know, to Confederates in the monuments that were built to those, you know, white heroes for some in Britain in the 1890s you know, to 1910s, who were often actually, you know, those people who were remembered from the 17th century or the 18th century. So the ideology of the evolution of culture in the Pitt Rivers was a weapon. And there was a, connect, a direct connection here where whiteness and projection come together. And that is in, and I'm, I'm really using Baldwin here, you know, James Baldwin's notion, or his account of whiteness as a false claim of evidence, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, a false claim of innocence that is based on the demonization of you know, that which is black or the people who are black. So whiteness is created as, as innocent, as sort of pure. That is linked into these ideas over ethics in a direct way. So when Augustus Henry Lane Fox Pitt Rivers, here at the Pitt Rivers Museum, in 1884, the same year as the invention of the Maxim machine gun, the same year as the Berlin Congress, here in Oxford, the Pitt Rivers, which was formed at the same time as the Ashmolean Museum went to its new location. So one museum for Europe and for civilization, one for everything else, a direct link, you know, you know, actually a two archaeology museums. You know, why does the University of Oxford have two archaeology museums? Because of an idea from 1884. This idea, the idea of the evolution of culture, as he had set it out, you know, 10 years, years earlier, was at the centre of what this museum was and many other museums like it. The idea that objects, in this case weapons, you know, could evolve. This is a hypothetical imagining of the evolution from in the middle, the wooden stick, out in different uh, ways. All these weapons taken from Aboriginal Australians over the years, actually many over 150 years by the British. You know, these are objects that he found in the Royal Armouries, in, 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 in the, the objects that were taken actually by soldiers. Um, 
p shows them in this hypothetical it's exactly like a cartographic projection it's a flattening of the world to say there's only one way in which things work they're constantly improving and of course at the height of this evolutionary sequence is victorian oxford so let's just make the point very clear because it may not yet be just to tie the threads together the reason african cultural restitution matters is because the shifting of position the shifting of the position that's in the projection relied upon the taking of objects the shifting of objects from from one location to another so the altar on the left hand side is kind of recreated here in the pit rivers on the right hand side and that recreation is it absolutely at the heart of what we need to understand as the fallism and restitution movements continue as long-standing you know fallism all the way back to the 1960s in algeria you know restitution all the way back to the 1930s in nigeria and earlier these are hand in hand outdoors and indoors anti-colonial african-led movements they matter because of the black lives matter observation that and um, that we need to care about anti-black violence this image of Rhodes here in oxford on the left hand side the image of colston here on the right who who fell last year in bristol or earlier this year in bristol you know these were images of white supremacy that naturalized inequality in precisely the same ways as the contemporary displays indoors did so they also were you know were white projections certain actions can make those white projections visible and i think the work of our colleague wazulu this crucial work activist work that is that is going on in france and elsewhere in uh, europe how does this work where where he you know he his activism involves he walks into museums he picks up an object he walks out with them while filming it it's a it's a visual protest it's a visual process the reason this is such powerful work is in part because it's operating with an ideology of the visual and 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 an ideology of you know time already it's working with the ideology of, of the, working against the, the ideology of your white projection it's working with the themes of justice you know who who's who's the criminal here it's working with themes of incarceration that anti-black violence continues to have this relationship between objects in museums and incarceration of people it shows that anti-black violence memorialized in objects in museums through which these things were taken has a relationship to anti-black violence and those of us who wish to oppose it in the present these are questions of objectification who's objectified who is how are these how are we going to allow cultures to live when you know when of course they must and it's about knowledge who gets to know you know what's in the museum what's in the store that isn't even on display what can and can't be seen so in order in order just to sum up then in my final minute what has happened in the past year even the past two years is that white projection is being resurrected in certain parts of the hard right as the way that you fight the progress of the black lives matter movement that's why the space we find ourselves in the cultural sector is so important for anti-racism at this moment because it has been resurrected in in actually yeah, directly racial terms we need to undo its flipped moral and ethical dimensions we need to see colonial violence and dispossession we need to make it visible we have a right to see and others africans have a right to see and not be others in these spaces not be othered we need to understand museums ongoing complicity and this is the this is the crunch because i think many of our museum uh, directors from berlin to london simply have not the penny hasn't dropped what are these objects they haven't realized these displays were part of a very specific ideology which we have to oppose now it's like nuclear waste 
it hurts people still today. It can still hurt people. It's like when uh, the uh, the Yorkshire Ripper, you know, this week was killed. Was it that? But he, he he died, you know, last week. I think it was last week. And there was this really interesting debate about should should his biography should you know should his obituary be written, because that will re-traumatize it will hurt the victims and the victims families again if you tell that story well it's the same for these objects of course we have serial killers you know like Cecil Rhodes who are being you know monumentalized you know the violence involved is the same so to tell the story better in these situations is simply to repeat the you know, the white projection that idea that we're going to create the spaces in order to keep you know, telling the story of this violence. And that's really in the book what I call a sort of Euro-pessimistic approach. The idea that as long as, you know, looted objects where their, their return is uh, demanded, as long as they are in European museums, the overwhelming layer of their history, that means the only thing we can see is that, is that sheer act of violence. We're never going to be able to uh, dig down into, you know, the meaning of these objects for, for those who care for them until we give them back. So this is about the, the building of a new sense of personhood, of humanity and how we curate. It's about the dismantling of the temporal dimensions of uh, uh, white projection, understanding Africa to be in the present and not in the past. And that means unpicking a whole host of ways that we think in archeology, span hist history and anthropology. We need to see the other means in which anti-black violence is naturalized and made to endure. I think there's a real contribution that we in the museum sector can make by showing, well, this is what we learned in the museum about how things were made you know, to naturalize and to make inequality endure. Yeah, you know, maybe the same thing happened in the law, maybe it happened in education, in the, the things we teach, your know, curriculums and so on. There's, of course, important work in undoing white projection to address all forms of debt. You're working for mem memory, for truth, for reconciliation, but also obviously in, in some cases, you know, questions of you know, money and you know, how that works. But ultimately the giving back of what's asked for and the sharing of knowledge of what there is in museums. In other words, we need to shift the position, we need to shift the positionality one further time. So white projection was about a shifting of position. We need to shift it back. So the knowledge is shared and so the objects are returned. Thank you.